Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Leaders Credit Union. Thank you, Zach, and welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's special guest, what is something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? So you and I have discussed the Banana Festival in Fulton, Kentucky on here before. Yes. But today in the in the train depot, I discovered the reason trains stopped in Fulton with bananas was so that each one could be, uh, the temperature could be taken on each banana. It was tested at the Fulton Ice Plant. That's why it stopped there. Wow, that is very, do you suppose they tested the temperature on a bunch of bananas or on each banana individually? I believe each well, that's a good question, actually, because it was quite a bit of bananas. Yeah, that's a, that's way too many bananas, I think, to be able to take the temperature of. And did they stick the thermometer into the banana? I don't think that's possible. So We, we don't have that detail here, but... I mean, you, we only live a few minutes from Fulton. Would you mind uh, doing a little more research on that for the next, for the next podcast? I'll, I'll see what I can do. Okay, I'm going to count on that because I do know that, I do know this much from and i know this from the train depot and the, what we learned there is that it was also kind of halfway between so they would ship mm-hmm. the bananas there and move them into a different ice car that was refilled with ice to get them the rest of the way the rest or of their kerosene journey. depending on the time of year oh i yeah. did not know that see gotta i keep, think gotta keep them warm in the winter I think we need a lot more about fulton and bananas do you know when is the when is the banana festival in fulton do you know? I don't know. Okay, I, that's your other assignment. You you need to, you know what? Here's what we need to do as a special guest on our podcast. We need to have someone from the annual banana festival to answer all these questions. Clearly, yeah. clearly there is a big gap in our knowledge on Fulton bananas, the festival, all that, all the above. So, our commitment to our listeners is that we are about to have, we are going to get a, a guest from there to to help us out. But today's yeah, yeah. guest, I don't know how much Brady knows about bananas, but I know he knows a lot about people going bananas because he has had a, a great, interesting life. Uh, Brady Weldon. Um, is a pastor, an entrepreneur, an entertainer. Uh, he's got a whole list of uh, titles. Welcome, Brady. Hello, guys. And I do know a lot about bananas. They are full of potassium. That's about the extent, I guess, you know. They're yellow. <laughs> They're yellow. Some are, you know. <laughs> Some are yellow. Yep. You want them to be yellow when you eat them. I know that much. They make great pudding. Yes, very much so, very much so. And I've been to the Banana Festival many, many times, and I'm telling you, some of the best banana pudding in the area, in the region, when you do it. So you got to go. Yeah, one hundred percent. Now, um, do we call you uh, Pastor Weldon, Brother Brady? What, what is, what do we call you? Do you just, just call me Brady. Somebody called me Reverend one time and I said, I looked around to see who they were talking about. So I was like, right, that's good. That's good. You know? <laughs> well, I know, I know that different, uh, different religions, different, different denominations have different, you know, ways. And I've been about everything. Uh, and so <laughs> I've, too. I've had pastors and brothers and reverends and doctors and, you know, I've had them all. So, yeah. uh, well then we'll just call you Brady. Yes. Um, so back us all the way up. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you came from and how'd you grow up? Yeah, well, I mean, I love, first of all, thank you for having me on. This is Zach and Scott, both. This is the incredible. I love um, what you guys do on this podcast because it really does feature a lot of great folks from the area. I was raised in Martin, Tennessee, and um, born and raised here um, in Martin, which is where I am actually today. Um, I live now. Uh, about 90% of my life in downtown Nashville, right off Broadway. So I smell stale beer and vomit and hear woohoo girls on pedal <laughs> taverns, bachelorette parties all the time, which I know Reverend shouldn't be saying that, but that's just how I am. I'm crazy. Um, <laughs> but I was raised here and, uh, you know, grew up right here in, in West Tennessee and um, started ministry uh, right here in some local churches, just, you know, kind of 
I didn't know what to do with my life. Honestly, I was actually a freshman at UTM and was failing miserably uh, in my uh, the thought, the way that I thought I was going to go in my life. And God just got a hold of me and changed everything and um, started kind of speaking in churches around West Tennessee right here. And um, wasn't long after that, that it just kind of began to blossom out, if you will. And uh, within about, I don't know, within about five or six years, I had been in 20, over 20 something states. And, uh, and then, of course, went and got the, the, all the degrees behind the name to try to, you know, have the credentials and everything. And then um, just spent the better part of the next couple of decades on the road speaking, starting churches, um, and then getting more involved in faith-based initiatives, kind of helping people get grants, started doing entrepreneurial speaking, motivational speaking, inspirational speaking outside of, um, of a church setting, which we would know from the belt buckle, the Bible belt, a Sunday morning setting. And then it just began to, I, I kind of got, to be honest with you, not burned out with church, but just kind of like, what else is there in this world? I, I began to relegate my entire life to a Sunday morning. And I thought, you know, there's got to be a way to impact people more. And I just began to tap into, if you will, my own sense of loss in the creative realm. And just begin to see that there's a lot of, uh, you know, from a Christian perspective, I believe that the creator has created us to be creative. And my life began to kind of take some turns into different avenues that, you know, you could really make an impact in this world if you just tapped into your own creativity and see what may be beneath the surface. And, um, you know, at, at that point, to make a long story short, that was uh, I, I've been do in ministry almost 35 years, so which is where all the hair went, you know. So um, <laughs> for all the listeners that aren't able to watch, of course, uh, they're just listening. There's no hair up there. I look like a roll-on deodorant now, and I blame <laughs> church for that. But, you know, it was, I tell you, Scott, it was one of the things, the, one of the great discoveries of my life is to begin to realize that you can impact people in the areas of faith and creativity um, in this world. And I tell you, it changed everything for me and a whole realm of different options opened up to me. And it wasn't just about believing the right stuff and then trying to behaviorally modify my life to fit a church. Um, it became more about this idea that um, it's not about convictions necessarily. It's about imagination that the creator has created us to be creative. And I, so nowadays, through all of the endeavors that we have, I preach and teach that uh, in church, out of church, all around the church. We pour into uh, creatives um, continually. And I know like for you guys at Discovery Park, you deal with that on a daily basis. How do we create events and things that that Im, uh, not only inspire people, but um, get them to see that their lives could be better also. And that's just kind of where my, my journey has gone uh, in a nutshell. So, so you said to make a long story short, well, you know, podcasts make a short story long. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's go back to what, what did your parents do while you were growing up? Like what was their calling? Absolutely. That, well, the, this is a funny dovetail back to the banana festival. My family, my grandfather in the 1930s started a trucking company and he actually started driving a Bob truck between Martin and surrounding areas in Chicago. He drove back and forth. And the two men who owned the Bob truck, my grandfather actually made more money <laughs> driving the Bob truck than they did. Their last names were Mr. Argo and Mr. Collier. And on the back of the Bob truck, they put Argo dash Collier. My grandfather made so much money driving the truck that he bought the truck, started a trucking company right here in Martin, Tennessee called Argo Collier which for decades and decades and decades was the largest business in West Tennessee. And the home base was right here in Martin. And the reason I laughed earlier about the banana is because my grandfather was one of the first trucking companies to haul Chiquita bananas in the United States of America. Yeah. Crazy. And yeah. it was, and it started right here. So I grew up sniffing diesel fumes. That's what's wrong with me, man. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and so I watched, even as a young man, my grandfather have this entrepreneurial aspect. He actually was an alderman and in Martin, and then later a, a long-term mayor in Martin. My grandma, his name was Cliff Weldon. My grandmother 
was Miss Virginia Weldon, who was in Martin, the first female alderman and then the first female mayor of Martin. Wow. So I, I come from this long line of business, yet helping people and entrepreneurial, and it's all just stirring around in me at all times, even to this day. Yeah, what do you remember about your grandmother uh, breaking ground in an area where there were probably some people who did not welcome her uh, involvement? The best, the, the most imp impactful thing I remember about her is she was willing to serve her city even without an office, even without being elected. Um, she was one of the founders of what we know as City Beautiful, which was through Woodman of the World and is now a national campaign. I would see my grandmother as a, as a child before she had any kind of position uh, in Martin. Um, she'd be down, um, I better be nice saying this, work in the street corner, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, digging flowers and planting of her own money and her own volition and bringing her tribe together of all of her friends. And um, I just remember her serving without anybody noticing. And that was that impacted me so much uh, as a young person to this day. And so was there any pushback at all from the family when she suddenly ran for mayor? No, it was it was the next logical, you know, step for her, honestly. Um, and, and that she, was probably in the 70s, uh, 80s, 80s, 80s Mid, in the 80s. Yes. She was mayor in um, she was alderman in the early 80s and then and then mayor in the mid to late 80s all the way through there. So I'm sure a lot of a lot of our listeners, I'm sure, remember her well and remember your grandfather. But, you know, I was not here then. I was in Texas then. So I don't uh, didn't know anything about all that. So sure. uh, that clearly inspired you uh, when you went to UT Martin. What was your major? It was uh, I was going into business, but I was horrible at it. Um, I grew up ADHD and diagnosed. Uh, and AD and dyslexic diagnosed. So my family would always say, my mom would always say, oh, Brady, one day you're going to have such great purpose in life. But until you do take this pill, you know, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and I was so I was when it came to, you know, academia and things like that, I really struggled right out of high school with it. Only when I got into the area of theology did I really find the, the kind of a place where I could settle in and philosophy. Um, and so I went that route uh, from a, from a college perspective. Only after that, did I start begin to start businesses and things like that entrepreneurial. Uh, after and so that. did you, you ended up, you majored, uh, did you end up majoring at UT Martin in philosophy or? Well, no, I ended up, I left there and went to union university in Jackson. Okay. So you went to it's, union mm -hmm. um, yeah. and that's, and at, at some point along the way you felt called into the ministry at that mm -hmm. time. Yeah, it was actually right before that. I I was um I was actually I knew about when I was about twelve years of age, but it was one of those things where it's like, no, nah, I wanna I wanna do other things. You know, I was into, uh, you know, I, of course I've always been a musician, so I, I was always into that. But this was something that I knew was a, I just knew from about twelve years of age that it was. In fact, they called me Bible Boy when I was in junior high school because I would have my science book up, but have a Bible behind it. Didn't even understand half of the words. I had one of those big honking Jean King James Version Bibles, you know, with ba naked baby angel pictures in it, you know, and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And I would be like, man, this is, I don't understand this, but there was something that resonated with me um, from a young person. Uh, I came to faith in Christ when I was a nine-year-old boy. And I knew at 12, I had, that there was something going on that was a purpose in my life. And my grandfather always said, he's going to be a preacher or a politician. So we'll see if that lasts whenever... <laughs> We'll see where that goes in the next few years. I have no idea, you know. <laughs> right. You might be the next mayor of uh, Martin. Um, well, uh, you never know. <laughs> yeah. My dad, my dad uh, knows the place where he was called into the ministry, where he was walking down to the barn to feed the horses. Yeah. And he just had this feeling like God had called him. And so anytime I had to feed the horses, I would like run a completely different way. <laughs> there you go. You know, and I, you know. <laughs> So anyway, no, that's, that's really great. And so you, were you also embracing music at this time? Yeah. I mean, when I was, a, when I was in my early, you know, uh, early twenties, it was, you know, I went the full route of ministry, you know, that kind of thing and, um, and loved it. I actually, you know, I just didn't know what to do. Uh, 
I just said, I don't even know what this kind of calling is. I, I didn't really have mentors. Um, so I just kind of went my own route. Within about five years, I got picked up by some of your folks might remember a, a men's movement called Promise Keepers in the 90s. They used to fill the stadiums and things. I was a kid at Union University, 21, 22 years of age, and actually met uh, the founder of it. His name's Coach Bill McCartney. And, um, and ended up four years after moving to Union University, I was still in college. I found myself standing in front of 80,000 men at Arrowhead Stadium in, in Kansas City, uh, preaching, speaking to them. And I was looking out going, what am I going to do with this? And so that's where kind of the national ministry that became international ministry started for me. Um, and it's just, it continued to blossom, you know, from, from there. Um, and so that, that continued to move uh, through college and things like that. Then I went on some mission trips that changed my life. You know, you go and help people in need. And, you know, I always say that when people go on mission trips with their church, they're actually not going to help. They actually get help for themselves and they get a perspective on their life and how blessed we are. Um, so I did a few of those and it just began to snowball from there. You know, in fact, Wait, after what? 30, 34 years into it, I just crossed. This is crazy. I just crossed my 42nd denomination of traveling and speaking in. What, what, uh, to what countries did you initially go to that were so life changing? I initially went, uh, the, I went to Honduras, actually, uh, went to Honduras. Uh, after that, I was over in, uh, Europe, uh, and then went back to Honduras and then, uh, Nicaragua. So a lot of Latin American, uh, countries have really made an impact on my life. And you're, are you, when you go here, there, are you speaking or are you singing? Or are you doing a combination of both? Sometimes speaking, to be honest with you, I, I really like to raise funds, build initiatives for uh, medical missions and things like that. That's not really about, you know, you kind of have to put your speaking thing aside. I used to do that. I'd say, all right, I'm going to go and preach to these people. And I would realize, especially in the, in the jungles way out there, um, they don't understand my, my country, Tennessee cliches and things. So it was a better impactful thing to, yes, we train pastors and do things like that for churches and start churches, but I get the greatest joy out of digging a water well, uh, and, and really, and, or doing medical missions that makes such an impact, you know, feeding people also, you know. So you, um, obviously, because of your appearance at Discovery Park of America at Rhythm on the Rails. Um, I know you more as a singer. Yeah. Um, was there a point at which you leaned one way or another? You leaned into music or leaned into speaking, or, or are you still lean in every which direction? <laughs> I am, I'm, every, I'm every direction. <laughs> I, I travel and speak. I, uh, I do a lot of uh, consulting for faith-based uh, initiatives for churches now. I spent, Scott, it's crazy. I, I spent, like I said, I've, all, I've been in ministry almost 35 years. I spent over almost 30 years on the road speaking in churches for about 30 weeks a year, mm. practically. Um, yeah. So I was doing that a lot, but there was these other sides to me. I, to back up, when I was a teenager and young, I, um, you know, my first concert was Elvis Presley. Now, I know I'm aging myself, but I was, I was very young. Um, but I remember, I, I still got a mental image of seeing Elvis Presley. I went from that to Kiss. So there you go. That's what's wrong. Which which Elvis <laughs> Presley concert were you at? Well, I was at the one, if, if any of your listeners, if they ever look up live in Memphis, he did two shows on that particular day at the Mid-South Coliseum. And my mom took me to the second show, which is actually 90% of that is the recording. Uh, that is on there. And I was there that, that day I was very young and I went to sleep during the concert. <laughs> but that's actually there. one of, that's actually, you know, if, if I, if friends say, you know, what, what about Elvis? You know, that's the, actually the CD that I used to give people and say, look, listen to this on your next road trip. Yes. You know, it's a great introduction to what Elvis really kind of became. Oh. Uh, and, and it's, it's not just the Elvis of, you know, all shook up and hound dog and, you mm -hmm. know, it's, really that is really a good a good introduction to the real elvis mm -hmm. absolutely it was and he was at his you know he was uh, he was at his his height right then you know i mean i i stage performance became something to me 
probably, if I look back, that and then going to the old Vanguard Theater at UTM to see plays uh, as a child. Um, those things were instilled in me as a performer even back then. And then, of course, I got a drum set and then I got into my neighbor down the road, got a guitar and we got into music, you know, discovered music together, um, uh, you know, as young, young people. And when I got older, I, I just never left that love for music. I actually kind of put singing in a band uh, aside for over 30 years because of ministry, you know, and the what, what will people think about, you know, what's that reverend doing singing songs like that, you know, or whatever. And um, it, it was something I kind of put aside, but I, I, I equate it to a beach ball that you have in the pool. You push it down and that ball's going to come back up, you know, eventually. And it's come up and uh, it's come out in the, cre like I said, the creative ways of, of performing and doing other things besides just standing on a platform and speaking. Not that that's, that's my number one calling, of course, uh, is to pour into people spiritually. But I also have began to realize, and especially with this, my friend Roy of the Roy Band, we, we hear every time we perform, and Roy actually um, owns a theater in Brentwood, Tennessee, and so we perform there regularly. And it's the craziest thing because people will leave and they'll say, I feel like I've been to church kind of tonight. And they don't know me. They don't know anything about us. And we go, you know, they go, man, I'm leaving kind of feeling good and inspired. And I think, you know, um, that's a great way to make an impact on people's lives. And so that's, that's kind of where it's been, you know? So before we leave it, I, I am curious when your friends, you, you all had instruments and you put together your first, you know, did you name, did you have a name for that band? Oh yes. We had several names, several said, names. I so mean, we throw, were, throw one out there. Well, well, the first in the first band was called vision. The second band was called eclipse. Okay. And there is out there, and it will be on YouTube, uh, on my YouTube page, Brady Wellen's YouTube page, on his ministry YouTube page very soon, a video that I found in my archives, a.k.a. my attic in some dusty box, <laughs> of a concert that Eclipse did in March of 1985 at the Martin Junior High School. Wow. In fact, last July, we did a show, Downtown Martin, and we had a big 30 by 30 LED video screen. And before I came out, the if you remember the old Bon Jovi song, Runaway, ooh, she's a little runaway. Mm -hmm. There's a video that comes up on the, on the screen of me at the Martin Junior High School and our band, Eclipse, playing that song. And then all of a sudden the video goes, you know, and like a tape rewind. And then all of a sudden it says 2023 the band on the stage right there starts that song. And then I come out and sing Runaway by Bon Jovi. It oh, was that's crazy. great. So we're going to be putting the entire show on uh, on on YouTube really soon. It's 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 amazing. That's fun. I was going to ask you if y'all were a contemporary Christian band, um, <laughs> but I guess you were more of a, a party band. It was, of course, we were all in high school, so we couldn't, we couldn't, the, the party was pretty much relegated to, you know, 8 p.m. at night, you know, <laughs> everybody had to be home, but it was just a love of music, and uh, and I was a freshman in high school then, wow. all, the, all the band members, they were all seniors, except for my friend, who was only a year older than me, accomplished musicians, uh, to this day they are, and yeah. um so we, we actually sent them the video of the concert in Martin that we did last year, and they just got the biggest kick out of it. We may even do a reunion one day. Who knows? You know, so. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. We're going to yeah. take a quick break, and when we get back, I'm going to um, – I got some more questions I want to dive into. With nine branches in West Tennessee and nationwide ATM and branch access, you can take Leaders Credit Union with you wherever you go. From checking accounts, credit cards, home loans, and their state-of-the-art mobile app, Banking with Leaders can help you move forward. Learn more and see how you can qualify for membership at leaderscu.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Brady Weldon. Brady, I'm curious. You said you went back to school and, and got uh, some of the credentials that you did. Did you go to seminary? 
Yes, yes, I did. What I did. seminary did you go to? I went through, I actually, it took me about three seminaries because of my dyslexia and ADHD. I went through three before I got out. Uh, I went to Biola University, uh, Talbot School of Theology in California. Also did some study through Oxford, uh, not Oxford, Mississippi, but Oxford in England. Uh, yeah. And then and then settled in uh, at Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. That's where my dad went okay. um, when I was in high school. Yeah. So um, I graduated from high school in 81. So from the late 70s to 81 is when we were in Fort Worth at Southwestern. Do you remember yeah. Gambrel Street Baptist Church? Of course, um, absolutely. That, that's where I went to church. And I don't know if you ever knew Dennis Swanberg. Uh, he's an entertainer. Dennis was my youth I've director. With, I've worked with Dennis many, many times over the years. Lots yeah, of men's was, conferences. He was my youth director. So oh. the, the next time you run into him, you, I was, I was um, uh, in the youth group when he met his his wife that he has now. He's been married for since then. But wow. I was there when he proposed. Not physically there when he proposed, but I was around. <laughs> I was in his uh, in his network when he proposed, and uh, he he took. A, I went with him on many missions trips and things like that as a little kid. So anyway, love love Dennis. You know, it's awesome because those people like that, that we would call Christian celebrities, when you get around them, what you begin to find is that there is a sense of realism. And 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 the, the people that I know that make up the greatest impact in the world are those people that just are as authentic as they can be. You know, um, it's easy, in, especially in the church realm, to become rather... Um, imitative of something or, or a little bit fake at times. And I, you get around people like Dennis and others that I, they make an impact, don't they? I mean, on oh, your life forever. Absolutely. Yeah. My, and, you know, I was fortunate to be a kid uh, going to be a youth. I was a youth my high school years and I was going to a church where, you know, 60% of the people were seminary students. Yeah. So our uh, youth to youth worker ratio was like, we had like four youth workers for every youth. So, you know, it was really, it was really a great experience to get to go through. And to your point, I'm curious, um, you know, culturally we're in a time where we're all kind of against each other in a lot of yeah. ways, you know, politically and socially. And, you know, how do you navigate your, your living you know, and working in many, many cases in a secular world, how do you navigate that, you know, in the world we live in today? It's a fabulous question. I mean, that is because that is the hotbed issue right now where I'm we're living in a day where where we have people of faith are seemingly getting in the corner, uh, you know, and huddling up a little bit more. Um, I, I, I've always tended to be somebody that goes against the pendulum. If the pendulum goes right, I go to the left. And if people begin to hole up, I want to unleash <laughs> and go out and make an impact in people. I mean, I, I began, I tell you one of the things that I began to notice, I began to notice, and I'm sure you guys have too, that in cultures either move people toward creativity and imagination or towards structure and standardization that begin to limit people. And I don't know anything that's put their thumb on people any stronger than religion. And when I say religion, I, I, I just to clarify for your listeners, when I talk about religion, I, I'm talking about the dogmatic, the 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 dry, crusty, <laughs> old school religious rules that people do. And I, it seems that in the last hundred years or more, I mean, so much of the church and even faith has been has spent time suppressing the creativity of people's lives rather than unleashing the gifts and talents of people to go Monday through Saturday. I live much more Monday through Saturday in in this world than I do Sunday. As much as I would love to be, you know, in church and just live and, you know, sit and read my Bible, I have to live in this world. And I made a conscious choice. And for me, it was not an easy choice because, and I'm sure you know this, people will peg you by how they first find you, you know. And people who saw me in the mid-90s in a church speaking somewhere, they still think I'm that, that three piece suit in wearing preacher, you know, um, and they'll always peg you by how they find you. And there, there's a little shock, you know, when they begin to see, wait a minute, Brady's doing what, you know, he's out there doing this or that. But the, the, to me, it's all about making an impact. I only have one life and I want God to use me in every single area that I'm even halfway gifted to, to try to be about. And, and, and the other thing is surrounding yourself with people 
who are creative, who have gifts and talents that you don't. That's the success. You know that uh, at Discovery Park of being, you know, the great way of making an impact is surrounding yourself with people who have gifts and talents that you don't. So there's a team mentality as as you move forward. And I don't know if that necessarily answers that question, but I I have just wanted so much to make an impact in people that um 90 percent i've kind of been known uh, honestly over the last couple of decades as a shepherd of the shattered that if you're broken come on i got you i will 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 pump you so full of hope and bible and help um that will will get you through to so that you can make ministry out of your own past misery you know yeah that's fantastic <laughs> um I, I are you so do you do you, and and again, this is like a last minute thing we got together. <laughs> Otherwise, I would already know the answer to this question. Yeah. Do you pastor a church right now? Are you every Sunday morning preaching, or are you just attending a church? No, I do. I'm not pastoring. Uh, okay. uh, in fact, I've only I've only done specific stints in churches that were honestly hurting and broken. Now I'm on the board. I'm bored to death. I'm on the board of seven different churches alone. <laughs> been a part of starting um, three, well, four churches, if you will, uh, in the United States of America, multiple outside of the states. But um, as far as being a pastor, pastor, no, I've always been a kind of a liaison and kind of a rebel, if you will. Not didn't mean to be. I love people. That's my problem is that I love I love people. I, and my idea of a good church service is when they leave, they're this high off the ground, you know, but I'm primarily in as many different churches on a given Sunday morning somewhere in America uh, as I can be. I've, I, the older I've gotten, I've gotten a little more, uh, not ticky, but I just, I want to, I'm just not going for going sake and speaking for speaking sake anymore. I really want to make an impact, you know, in specific areas. And then for, for the music side of what you do, where is someone most likely other than at Rhythm on the Rails at Discovery Park of America, where are they likely to be able to see you perform? Well, right now, um, there is, I've been given a title in Nashville, the, in Music City, that I never asked for. So this is, I didn't come up with this. Don't send me emails. This is what was given to me. They call me the rock and roll reverend <laughs> in Nashville. <laughs> okay. uh, it's crazy because I have actually spent, in, in ministry, I've also, I mean, I've done countless, I, I started in radio, I've done countless television uh hosting. I used to host the Miss Tennessee pageant uh, for years and years and years. Done a lot of different things all over the country like that. And so in Nashville, I'm kind of a, an MC, if you will, of different events that happen. And then my friend Roy of the Roy Band, um, he begged me for about three years, please come up and sing uh, at, our, at our theater. He owns a theater, like I said, in Brentwood. And I played hard to get because I was like, no, nah, you know, you know, I don't know what people will think. This is not, you know, I, I'm like you. I, you know, I had the 80s music in me back then. And one night he got completely sick before a show that they were doing. And it was, a, I think the theater was sold out. And he literally came in and he was croaking like a frog. And he said, here, you have to do this. And I looked at the song list and I was like, I knew almost every single song. But I said, I'm not singing a John Cougar Mellencamp song. Ain't going to do it, dude. I'll sing anything else. And I ended up going out and singing most of the set. And it was like the beach ball under, under the pool water. This thing came up and I turned into a spider monkey on stage and <laughs> sang my heart out. And I absolutely loved it. Loved it. And so Roy's become a dear, dear friend of mine. And we are... He, he's on it's his fault so you know he's unleashed this thing that i had pushed down for a long time i'd say in christian groups you know and done things like that but just to get up and wail on a bon jovi song or a journey song i didn't know i could do it and uh man it's been it's been a lot of fun if nothing else I don't so take myself too seriously with it, you know. <laughs> so you've got it. You, I know you've got a Facebook page, and you've got you, – do you have BradyWeldon.com? Is that what it is? Yeah, BradyWeldon.com, uh, two Facebook pages, Instagram, also Brady Weldon. So, so, so you're, you're putting the content out there. Um, yeah. 
on social media. So if somebody's uh, curious where they can hear you perform or mm-hmm. or hear more, I know little snippets of your sermons are on your Facebook page. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did go check that out. So that's where they can track you down. And the and, full sermons are on the full sermons are on YouTube on Brady Wellness okay. YouTube page. We have tons and tons of stuff. It, you know, if anybody's going through some stuff in their life, going through rough times. Whatever. I mean, that's what we're geared toward, especially on the YouTube page and the Facebook pages also. And you can get to all that from BradyWeldon.com. There's links mm-hmm. to everything on there, and yep. there's a link tree on there that folks can track you down if they need to Definitely. Um, see you. Thank you so much for, first of all, for being here with us today, but also thank you for coming to Rhythm on the Rails. I can't wait. Uh, man, I, I'm telling you, I know that everybody has worked so hard over these weeks and we want to not end it with a period. I, I'm not going to give you secrets away. We're ending it with an exclamation point, and it's going to be a rocking night. And I'll tell you this, the Roy Band, the musicians in the Roy Band are some of the greatest world-class musicians. Uh, Dave Klo used to tour with Michael Tate, DC Talk. Um, we have the rock star herself, Miss Kimberly Dom, coming. Kimberly was in the band Boston for two decades. Mm. She is a an amazing songwriter to this day. Uh, Mark Pollock, the bass player, is a, one of one of Nashville's greatest engineers and producers. I mean, the the two hacks and posers on the stage are Roy and Brady. <laughs> so, <laughs> we we just surround ourselves with these incredible people, you know, and. We're bringing out all the stops. We're going to bring as much, and gosh, I don't want to give the secrets away, but we're going to bring as much of our show um, for that last night as we can absolutely put without blowing up the Total Tech Solution stage. I'm telling you, it's going to be phenomenal. They don't need to miss it. It's going to be fun. Well, I know Zach here who handles all of our social media. He's going to be hyping it up. He's even more excited now, I can tell. They've sent me some good video, too. I'm telling you, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a time. I, I I told Carl Johnson, I said, you, Wesley Edwards, all the crew, drink extra coffee. I'm gonna bring extra energy drinks for everybody because it's going to be it's just gonna be a blast. And I wanna I we wanna do this for Discovery Park and the people of Union City and the surrounding area in the region. Uh, we're already getting uh, we get emails and texts daily from people coming from Illinois, Kentucky, even far off countries like North Mississippi and you know, <laughs> all the way around. I mean, there's a lot of people coming in town for this. So we're praying for good weather, praying yeah. it's going to be great. And uh, and I'm telling you, we're going it's going to be a blast. And I think it's a fitting ending to another great season of rhythm on the rails so we're yeah I, I appreciate that I, I cannot wait i'm really excited about that and thank you just for spending some time it was fun getting to chat with you a little bit getting to know you a little bit better other than just videos yeah. on a screen so thank absolutely. you no absolutely i i love what uh discovery park stands for what you guys do for the community and uh you know i'm a, like i said i'm a west tennessee guy i still have a home in west tennessee in martin because mama lives in martin so i'm still back and forth you know um but i always keep up with it and what you guys are doing is just absolutely amazing and it's gonna uh, that night is gonna be a blast and we want to we want to hit the level of the excellence that discovery park does bring to the area so we're gonna oh, have I, a- I i cannot wait and i have no doubt that you guys are going to do that <laughs> And, and thank you to all you listeners who joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Mm-hmm.